Welcome everyone to this uh, Data for Good uh, meetup with uh, the launch of our uh, virtual uh, micro datathon uh, number one. Before we get into the details of the uh, the micro datathon, uh, those there may be some of you that are new to Data for Good. I just wanted to give a little bit of background on on Data for Good and, and how we uh, got to these ideas of the uh, the micro datathons. So Data for Good, um, we're uh, all of us are a group of uh, passionate, socially minded, and curious volunteers that use our uh, data skills, uh, whatever they may be, and other skills uh, for social good. Our aim really is to help uh, nonprofit and social organizations harness the power of data uh, to leverage impact um, in the community. And here in the Calgary chapter, we're, we're one of uh, nine different chapters across, uh, across Canada, in Toronto, Ottawa, Montreal, Halifax, uh, Waterloo, Regina, Edmonton, and Vancouver. And uh, we're always looking to expand. So if you know of anybody in any other cities across Canada, uh, let them know and we, uh, we would um, really want to be expanding and, and setting up new chapters and, in different uh, different cities. So here in Calgary, um, we're putting data into action for social good uh, since November of 2013. And uh, we have over uh, 1,600 members now. And uh, we have a number of ways that we work. Um, we do our uh, large uh, events, our weekend events called datathons, uh, once or twice a year. And I'll speak more about that in a minute. Uh, for smaller not-for-profit organizations that have data challenges or want a little bit of help, um, we uh, have our data cores and our data uh, ambassadors that work on volunteer projects that are smaller scale projects. And here tonight is one of our typical meetups uh, on the fourth uh, Thursday um, of the month. Uh, most of you have come into our meetup group and please spread the word and have other friends uh, and colleagues sign up. Uh, we have a Twitter handle at uh, data, at data for good uh, YYC. And uh, let's generate some traffic on that uh, this evening. And we do have a national website at uh, dataforgood.ca. Um, so over the years, we've uh, worked with many nonprofit and social organizations. Um, Across Canada, you'll see a number of groups across Canada, um, and here in Calgary as well, with the uh, Distress Center, Women's Emergency Shelter, Calgary Foundation, um, and others. So this year, uh, we're proud to, um, proud to announce that uh, our uh, partner for the Datathon in uh, 2020 is the uh, Calgary Homeless Foundation. And uh, we actually started working with the Homeless Foundation um, uh, very early this year. And our intent was to have our datathon at the end of May. Um, now, of course, because of uh, COVID-19 and everything that's going on, uh, we've had to uh, reschedule that. So we will move that face-to-face um, -face datathon. And it's typically a, a Friday night, all day Saturday and Sunday morning event. Uh, those of you who have attended, it's a really great experience and we encourage all of our members to uh, participate. But we didn't want to wait till then to, uh, to engage you, engage our community uh, with some of the amazing data sets that we're, we're curating uh, for, the, uh, for the Calgary Homeless Foundation and the concept of homelessness and poverty and, and some of those social issues um, in uh, in Calgary. So what we've decided to do is to come up with a series of um, uh, virtual micro datathons. So this is our first one on uh, geospatial data and we plan to have one uh, over the next uh, few months. And the idea is to launch it at, uh, at our regular meetup, uh, the fourth Thursday of the month, um, bring in a, a whole bunch of uh, data uh, provide some uh, background and some tools and recommendations and uh, resources for you to use 
to, uh, to play with the data, to work with the data, get some experience in using those tools, and also understand the data itself, uh, leading up to the, the larger data thon um, in the fall. So, um, at this, uh, at the launch here of the micro data thon number one, uh, this is going to be our uh, schedule for the, uh, the evening. So I'm starting off here with the uh, with the background, and then um, we'll have uh, uh, Henna who will talk about uh, the uh, data access uh, platforms that we have and uh, the best ways to be uh, sharing sharing your work over the course of the month, and um, any conversations and those sorts of things that you want to have uh, with the group. So you know, over the course of the month, we want it to be very interactive. We want you guys to do a whole bunch of work, but share that work and ask questions and draw some insights. Uh, we'll then have Paula talk about some of the recommended software. Um, also review the uh, amazing videos that uh, uh, Paula has done as a way for you offline uh, during the course of the month to go back and look at those videos and uh, get some tips and tricks on how to use geospatial data. Uh, Paula will then will give a bit of an overview on the, the subject area. Uh, Corinne will talk about the data models that we've used for this um, micro data thon. Um, and then Paula will uh, give you some demos and some really uh, great insights into how to use the data in some very, very practical uh, ways. But um, we have more than just the data. So we have uh, some challenges that we'd uh, like you to work on. Um, over the course of the month, uh, various levels, uh, basic, some basic uh, challenges, intermediate and advanced. So feel free, uh, whatever level you may be, um, to use those challenges to get started. Um, but we'd like to even, even go much further than that as well. So to use other data sets and um, do some combinations that we haven't thought of before. But so the challenges are there really to get you started and, uh, and to kind of get you going. And finally, I'll uh, wrap up uh, at the at the end of the uh, at the end of the evening here. So, I will sign off on the uh, on the background piece. Um, remember to uh, if you have any questions, put them in the um, the chat function. Uh, we'll try to answer some of those as we're going through or at the end. Those that we don't get to, we'll try to answer offline. Uh, um, once this uh, presentation is over and get the, some of the answers to you. So I've stopped sharing. Uh, Hannah, it's your turn. Okay. Um, okay, hi everyone. I'm Hannah. I'm part of uh, the Data for Good core team. And um, I'm going to tell you how to access this data and how to submit your results and how can we keep a good active communication. So all the data, we have placed it in a project in data.world. And here is the link for it. So I'm going to click on it and show you guys. Um, sorry. So I have a login. Let me sign out quickly. So this is where you'll end up. So you can either you click on login page and then you can either log in if you have an account or down here there's a sign up now it's a quick uh, sign up so you should sign up here and once you have the login you can sign in um, and you'll get um, something like this an interface and here you can either now uh, search here for data for good and then um, uh, search the micro data on project from here or in the document that we have shared with you we have uh, placed a link uh, for the project. So if you just click on the link, it'll take you to the project page. So um, the project's name is Microdata on One, and this is all about geospatial stuff. So here's a little overview um, and a summary of uh, what this project has, the data models and everything is in here. To access all the files, you can, on this right over here, there's a launch workspace button. So if you click on it, it'll show you all the files on the left side, there's a project summary. Um, then uh, you see some PDFs here. They have the data models and instruction document, which has all the possible uh, details that you might need, uh, is right here. And uh, it'll open up if you click on it. Also, all the data files uh, are here. And as soon as you uh, 
hover over any one of them, you'll get a, a short description. Now from here, you can either um, use um, a cool feature that data.world has where you can use different integrations. So you can, instead of um, downloading uh, this data files one by one, you can also just have integrations with R or Python or Power BI or Tableau. Or um, if you think you don't want to do that, you can also download the files uh, from here. So this is the part of how you can access the data. The next thing um, that we really want you guys to do is actually share your results with us, no matter you know whatever stage you've gotten to or whatever um, insights you have for us, please do share it, uh, them with us. And for that, um, you can click on um, this link here. It'll take you back to the project page that we have, but this time it'll take you to the insights page. So here, what you can do is you can say, click on this button on the right that says add a new insight. And uh, once you click on this, it'll give you a kind of a, opens up a document where you can um, paste uh, figures, you can uh, do a write up, uh, you can also switch to markdown if you're more comfortable in, in writing there. So this is the way you can share with us that, hey guys, um, this is what I've done with the data. These are some interesting plots. Um, and if you actually want to go a step further and then share with us your code, some files, you can um, actually go, um, you can write, we have our own, um, so Data for uh, Good has its own next cloud where you can upload all the uh, code and files. Um, and to get access to it, uh, please write an email to dataopsyyc at dataforgood.ca and we'll give you um, the credentials for login. Um, and one request that we have, and it's in the document, is that please add your first and last name into uh, the folder that you put in Nextcloud and also the insights page that you're creating that I just showed you. Uh, please name it with your first and last name so we have a way of contacting you. Um, also for any kind of communications, if you have any questions, if you have any problems or you just want to share something, um, we have made a Slack page um, for um, this particular uh, data zone. So if you have your own, um, you already have a, a Slack account, uh, here's a link of how to um, get to uh, our Slack channel. And here you can see this is the micro data on one um, channel that we have. And you can, from here, it's a public page, so you can uh, share whatever you want to share. If you have a question, please ask there and, and we'll get back to you. Um, okay, that's all that I, was supposed to do, so I'm going to stop sharing now. Okay, okay so Paula, you're next to talk about the software and the videos. Okay, um, getting set. Um, share the screen. That always helps, right? Um, so you guys can see my screen now. Correct. I'm, I'm thinking Jeff looks like he can see the screen, so I'm going to go for it, man. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so um, I, I'm not going to start here. What I, uh, based on the, what we did yesterday and how um, Zoom was working, I put everything in a PowerPoint. I mean, in, P, in Power BI. So uh, if you are a Power BI user or are going to uh, download the, the desktop, which I'll talk about, um, you can actually, it's all in here. So um, you can have your own version of it. Oops, that's not how I wanted to get rid of that. I might bring it up again. So um, the first thing I'm supposed to talk about is um, what software to use or what you can use. And of course, we're looking for stuff that's free. Um, so Tableau Public is free. Uh, it's, it's not the Tableau desktop, but that's fine because you can use it. Um, you just have to create an account, a public account with Tableau um, Public and is also great because uh, you end up creating a profile that you can show people, um, but you can't actually save anything to your disk, which uh, works well for full public data, which we're using in this uh, micro datathon. Um, but say for the, the fall uh, datathon, you kind of have to be aware if you can share it or not publicly. You know, stop and pause and think what you can actually do or entitled to do. But for this, you're fine. Uh, Power BI Desktop is a download. Um, it is 
works on the Windows operating system. So there's a little bit of a hook there um, for the desktop. All your data is contained in that uh, file. So like an Excel file has an XLSX, uh, a Power BI file has a .pbix ending and uh, everything is contained within that. So you can share that, but again, um, you know, be aware that you're doing that and see if you can share it. Um, and yeah, it's, I think that's, you don't have to sign in to use it. So even if you download it, and here's the links I'm providing. So this one is a page with a download. This is a page with a download. Um, and then you, you actually use it. It'll say to sign in, like, don't bother. There's a little X at the top, click that X and you're in and you're using it for free, which is awesome. Um, if you are on a Mac or some other hardware, um, uh, you can, and if you're lucky to have an account already and are a member of somebody's Power BI service, so that's a case where you actually have access to a license, then you can actually use any browser. Um, and, and here's a picture of my browser. I think I'm using Edge, which is also pretty amazing that it works in that. Uh, I, I usually use Chrome, but you can, you can use it that way. The catch there is you actually have to have a license. So... Then I go on to videos. I made these videos and um, sorry, Minnie's wrong, but in the description down here, micro one is correct. Uh, I didn't want to edit the video because it would have a different URL. So that's, that's just not good. Uh, I did do a series of videos because uh, spatial data is a big topic. And um, also we're sort of trying to cater to people who may not know Power BI. Um, you know, maybe I'll do some Tableau ones later. And uh, we did a lot of work beforehand, and this is also trying to help people understand what's, what's going on. So the, the page that went out to everybody, these videos aren't in order, uh, you know, it's to make you stay awake, I think. Uh, but uh, if you actually take this link to the uh, playlist, then you'll get this order, and that's an order I suggest. Of course, you don't need to look at everything, so. It's really up to you. And um, this is easy because uh, yeah, I don't have to answer questions because I don't see any. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna move right, oh, wait a second. No, I promised I was gonna do that. So here I am in Power BI. I didn't wanna show you the fields, the visualization, because if you can see in Power BI, there's R and there's Python plugs in there. There's also ways you can do D3, so you're not, um, stuck in any modern BI tool. Uh, Tableau should be able to do R as well. Um, I'm not sure on the Python integration. And of course, you can use RStudio and um, Anaconda and, and Jupyter Notebooks. So that's the sort of uh, free, um, all those tools you can use. And we prepared the data for. So um, now, I'm gonna move into CRS because it is still me. Um, so when we talk about spatial data, we have to talk about making maps. And maybe I should go to my front page here because you know, <laughs> uh, here's the title page and we are here. This is uh, North America and I, I have some data set that says Calgary and it knows where to plot that up based on that city name. That's what I'm using here. Um, I want you guys to take a good look at this map, maybe take a look good at, at Antarctica here and just uh, in the north of Canada and just keep that in your memory because um, hopefully it'll come up. So um, there's a coordinate reference system or CRS and I am also giving you links in this uh, Power BI file. So uh, of resources, because this is a topic that you just can't, uh, you know, I'm not going to teach you everything in a day and neither, I, I don't say, think I know everything either. So, <laughs> so uh, basically we need measurements to describe where we are on earth. And in our case, we're going to, uh, you know, put some measurements against a location on earth to, to help our analytics. And we need, uh, we don't live in that flat planet. I don't believe, I'm not in the flat earth society. So I actually believe we're on something that's not flat and um, we need to figure out how to map those things. So, you know, here's um, the earth, not a perfect sphere and maybe not a perfect viz because I cut some off. Um, 
and um, there's ways to visualize that. You know, we've all seen a, a globe and we all know that a globe can be cut up and by longitude and latitude. Um, longitude is your, your sort of X that becomes your X direction and your latitude becomes uh, up and down from the equator. And they are called geographic. And, um, you know, we're talking about horizontal datums. We're not talking about the elevation of say Mount Everest. We're talking about where it is along the X, Y, lat long on that globe that we model this not perfect earth shape of. These are called geodetic datums as well and their longitude latitude. So there isn't just one uh, longitude latitude, it actually depends what system you're working in. Another way is, uh, well, we often have put maps um, and here's a picture of a book. So on a flat surface, you know, we carry maps all over the place, it is very practical for a detailed point of view for us to have it in a, um, a plane. A, a square two-dimensional piece of paper, also called a Cartesian plane with other sort of X and Y units. We're not really gonna go into it. That's as far as I'm gonna go into because basically, um, this is sort of leading into that. If you're wondering, we're not gonna worry about projections. So the projections are really trying to put it on that flat piece of paper. Um, and as you can see by this sketch, and if you actually take the look at it, it, it at that link, it, it's much bigger. Um, you know, with modern BI systems and GPS development and uh, mobile app development and big leaders like Google um, and with their maps and uh, Microsoft OpenStreetMap um, following, uh, we really have a, a de facto standard and, um, and we're not going to project. Um, once you're, you're gonna, we're gonna use WGS84, which is the next tab here. But uh, once you come into these BI tools, some of them will allow you projection. Power BI actually has three other ways, three ways to view what you, what you bring a map in with um, on the specific map that we're gonna talk about uh, when you have the ability to bring it in. And uh, Tableau really doesn't let you choose. So, um, we're not dealing with what projection to use when. There's really only one choice to come in with these tools with. Um, so if you looked at the, the front page, right? <laughs> did, did Canada look pretty strange to you guys? You know, that north of Canada it looks pretty darn big. Should have should have bought property up there, maybe. I don't. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, there might, within Power BI, you may want to try this orthographic. Um, if you're plotting all of Canada, okay? So it also depends on what you're doing. So just a bit on uh, WGS. Um, this is taking a little while to, to plot here on this side because it's actually live in Power BI. Um, this is uh, an open page. Um, this is really the standard. So WGS84, a pseudo mercator, a spherical mercator, it is in lat long. You don't need to know this detail unless you wanna start programming at this level, but basically the modern BI tools take care of all this stuff for you. You're going to make sure that your data in this is in the system when it goes in though. Um, again, if you want more um, detail on this, I have two links here. Uh, one reason why uh, WGS84 was, I think, initially developed by Google, um, was uh, you want to do uh, vector map tiling. And the reason why you have map tiling is you actually want, you know, the response on your phone. Like when I look up New Zealand, for whatever reason, uh, on my cell phone, it goes there fast. Or if I want to look up Norway, it doesn't take a long way to render that map with all the detail, even with the places that you can go and have coffee at, right? So they're using um, this map tiling technology. Um, and uh, of course, uh, GPS technology is, is, has created a unified model around the WGS84. And again, here's your detailed links to that. Um, I like what it says here. It says Google Maps, OpenStreetMap, Bing, Bing, sorry, ArcGIS and Esri. So all the big, all the big ones, right? And uh, Power BI. Microsoft pretty much owns Bing and uh, Tableau down here. You can see it uses OpenStreetMap for data. 
So uh, that's relevant. You know, they're all using that WGS84. Now, Power BI needs is a little special. So if we're going to do a, a map that has shapes, and this is the Alberta Health Regions, which we'll use, we'll do a little exercise on at the demo. Um, I'm just checking my time. Sorry. Uh, you have to, it doesn't use an Esri shape file. An Esri shape file has more than one um, file to it. So if you see all these guys with the same uh, prefix, the same name, a STEM, the aggregate local geographic area, this is a Alberta Health data set, um, all those files belong to that shape file. So when we look at it on data.world under the raw data, if you really want to start from square one, um, they, they are in the uh, in the connected spatial files and there's a zillion of them. <laughs> and uh, they would be the ones that are zipped. So just for you to know that. But basically what I've done, because we sort of focused around Power BI, is, uh, oh, the first thing I had to check too is this projection file. So that file uh, really tells me whether it's projected or if we're in the right system, which is WGS84. Um, you know, I've, I've done this work, so I'm telling you what was done as opposed to you need to worry about to know this in detail unless you want to. So to inform you, is uh, this data did come in in a different projection. That isn't going to work <laughs> for Power BI. It wants to be in this WGS 1984. Uh, I used a package called QGIS, which if you go look at the videos, I have a little uh, thing on QGIS um, and links later that will, if you want to learn more about QGIS, there's tutorials there. And uh, used it to change the projection to the right one. Okay, still, I can't use a shape file in Power BI. I could take that shape file now into Tableau though. It'll take that. Uh, Power BI, I need to go a step further and use this map shaper tool for free. I bring it in, just bring all those files together, just slide them into this tool on the web. And um, eventually I just export and it wants topo JSON. Okay, not just JSON, it wants topo JSON. So you can always refer to this, uh, this slide on this, uh, PBX file um, that you can download. And uh, so that maybe I should have this remember bigger. <laughs> so remember, I, we did all this work for you. Um, it's on data.world, it's all public data and you know I'm happy, just share it really. Um, and if I go back here in this, this uh, minimum data set here, you'll see that, oh yeah, um, these are the ones. So uh, WGS84, just to make sure you know it's WGS84, and um, for Power BI is in there in the description. And there's two of them in the minimum data set because we'll go through in a demo on just the two of them. Uh, all of them are in here somewhere. Like really, it's hard for, uh, there's a, a top of JSON right there. So that's where you can look if they're not in the minimum product that we created. Okay, what do you can you map? Well, you can map uh, points, lines, and polygons. Um, again, these two are live in this in this uh, in this Power BI file. You can see they're filtering there between the two. Um, for this date, this is our data set. The organizations of uh, lat long that I think are relevant or something that we could at least start with and, and grow um, for our fall data thon. Um, because I think there's over 12,000 uh, organizations that are nonprofits in Calgary and they're not all relevant for um, homelessness. So the attempt was to get a, a manageable set. And uh, I think we're around you know, over 400. Um, are they all great? Well, no. Some of them might have to do with the animal rescue, <laughs> may or may not be relevant, but that's for us to work at these data sets through. Um, so uh, our core data set are the points. This is an example of lines. As of yet, we, we don't really have a use for lines unless you want to find proximity to the church and you can create your own lines. I did not have them. 
Uh, but I, the, what I did have was something I did for a makeover Monday exercise on Tableau. And that's actually migrate, migration lines of turkey vultures. <laughs> um, if you want to learn Tableau, Makeover Monday is a great thing to, to get exposed to, by the way. And the other thing that you want to, and, and what we'll teach you here is that might be different and that you need the topo JSON for is to create polygons. And here I actually have community polygons um, for Calgary. Why is it not all you know, colorful? It's not all colorful because the model is constraining it to the actual lat long data that we have. So uh, the colors correspond to where there are dots, basically. Okay, and here we go. I only have accuracy. This is in here to just remind, I just love it, XKCD, uh, read down it, not now. Um, how many decimals do you need for the what you're trying to convey? Think about it. Do you have to care? Are you gonna give away anything that you shouldn't because of security? Another thing to think about. Um, the shapes we have in that bigger spatial file directory are uh, quadrant, ward, uh, Alberta Health uh, aggregate area, which we'll work with, um, a polygon forward sortation area. If you look at the intro video, um, I talk about it a bit, or I have Anyways, go through the videos, you get the extra thing. I have tons, not very much time here to explain everything. Community and census tract, getting us ready to bring in StatsCan data. Um, yeah, all the core minimum product is here. All the extra full-blown deal is here. Just a little warning about forward sortation area. So that has to do with the first three characters of everybody's postal code. Um, this is the larger, believe it or not, Calgary's in here. And all, um, so when you get to the perimeter of Calgary, these things get really big. Um, some uh, FSAs have more than one polygon. Uh, for example, um, by the way, you can uh, change uh, the way these shape files display by color. That's under these little paint roller things, which we'll I'll demo and talk about that. Um, but this is an FSA polygon over uh, Calgary that has two parts, T2G. Uh, I, I'm trying to figure out if I should do this. <laughs> um, yeah, I may have some mistake. I won't. Um, so, um, and it. The way we have our data set up, you can at least tell what Calgary communities are associated with it. And if I have Chinatown and Aboya showing up the same one, maybe maybe FSA isn't what I should be using, um, depending on what uh, answer I'm trying to get at for analysis. So just to keep those things in mind. Um, I'm on a different screen, maybe that's why it didn't make a difference. Power BI, you also have other options. So um, if you delve into Mapbox, I do, it's great. Here's an example of a heat map. You have more control about how your map looks. Um, if you have an ESRI license, because where you work or you own one, uh, you can also get into ESRI, which is down here. I don't, <laughs> um, although they had it on demo. and. Uh, you have different backgrounds. The default ones here are from Power BI. Microsoft are uh, based with Bing. Um, this is a little bit about a chloropleth map because that's the new thing that hopefully we're going to show you what to do. And um, the key here is it's usually a normalized value in here. So just a count of uh, a number of people um, you know, uh, an air, one area might be more pop, populous, populated than another area. So you, are you actually making a great comparison? You have to think about that. So I stuck this guy here, not too bad. Quick read um, and a wiki. Um, some uh, course, he, he's talking about this here. If you can see the example, Starbucks per 100,000 residences. Uh, residents. So it's a good comparison. It's not just the count of Starbucks locations. Um, and here is a, an R uh, journalism course. He's got a whole section on spatial analysis. Really good. Um, 
There's also a course, a journalism course that's open and free. And if you want to know more and get QGIS tutorials, uh, these are great. They also have quick videos, awesome things. And then uh, that is it. I'm done for now. Great. Thanks, Paula, for that overview. We'll be coming back shortly. But first, uh, uh, Corrine's going to talk to us about oh, the uh, data models. You need to stop sharing. Yeah, there you go. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. I guess good evening. Can you see my screen? Oh, sorry. That should do the trick now. Yep, got it now. Okay. So here we are in the microdatathon number one, getting to know geospatial. And the first thing I'll let you see is uh, where you can see information about the data model. You, because uh, the data model we've created to show you how all these files link together, because you can see this long list in data.world, but it doesn't tell you how they're related and it can be a bit intimidating. So what we've done is we have created a data model that puts things into perspective. And you can find this data model in a few places. So first of all, in the project summary, we've got the high level data model and then the detailed data model. And there's a data dictionary that you can access in uh, data.world as well. So if you're looking at the AHS area, for example, you can see the column names, the type, and the description. This is largely filled in and will continue to fill in definitions here for your convenience. We also have the data model in these four files. And the reason we've done this is just to supplement the information that you see here in data.world. So we'll start with the overview diagram. And this overview diagram just gives you a very high level view of how things look. So first of all, in the center of the universe is our organization table which is about 300, 400 organizations that have to do with helping the homeless, addictions, et cetera. They are organizations that will be helpful to know about this fall. Above that, we have all these shape files that Paula has associated with the organizations. So based on the lat long of an organization, you can see what community, what ward, what quadrant of the city, what census tract, what FSA and what AHS area you'll find the data in. Down below, we can see what Google Place keywords and Calgary Foundation issues are associated with this organization. So um, when Paula put this list together, partly by searching for places in Google um, Place based on keywords like uh, homelessness, addiction, poverty, and she got a list of places, a list of organizations. And then she went to Calgary Foundation and looked for um, their list of nonprofits. She pulled all of those into organization. So an organization may have many keywords and a keyword may describe many organizations. On this side of the diagram, we have some, we've um, added to the information about organizations by saying what nonprofits may be associated with that organization and what CRA donees may be associated with these organizations. And the CRA donee would then lead us to being able to see how much money a charity has been given. So you might later be able to do queries about how much money do they get, how much do they seem to do to help homelessness, if you can find a way to measure that. Finally, these white areas here are the numbers. So Paula will be doing a little sample around AHS COVID case counts, because that's very topical. On the left side, we have the Calgary Census, and the Calgary Census is associated by community. So that's why there's a link here between Calgary Census and community. Just as here, there's a link between AHS, 
COVID case count and the AHS areas. And down below, one of the supplemental bonus marks, you could say, data sets is the emergency shelter occupancy, which is an open data set from the Alberta government. And this, of course, will be very useful to work with in the fall. You'll see the relationship looks a bit different, and that's because we have not yet built the relationship between the organizations in this emergency shelter file and this organization file that we've started. So one of the challenges we'll be giving people is whether they want to build that relationship, that cross-reference table. More about that later. So this is your very high level diagram that gives you the idea of the shape files, the reference data in green, and the counts. Now the next uh, file we have is a logical data model, and that puts things into more detail. So now you can see what columns we have for community, what columns we have for the Calgary census, by the way, this is just a subset. You can tell that I just cut it off because there's about a hundred columns in here, but they follow a pattern. So when you open this up, you'll figure it out. Um, all the things we have for AHS area and all the things we have for organization. So these shape files, remember, will be great for plotting when you're working in Power BI. They will give you those community outlines. These organizations have a lat long, and that allows us to have those points on the graph. So this yellow shows you all the um, shape data you have to work with. Now, the diagrams will help you see how things are related. So remember to keep an eye on these lines. These lines show the relationships between the tables. In addition to that, though, you should be interested in definitions because definitions help you understand what's actually in those tables. So I've created two spreadsheets. One is for uh, the tables, it gives the table name and the definition. And sometimes it gives some nice extra information like for Google Place, it gives you the list of keywords that Paula used to search for organizations. And likewise, for the Calgary Foundation, she gave that information. Uh, the columns give you a description of all the columns. So here's the entity or table name, the column name, and then the definition. So you can see for a Calgary Census, if you want to know what uh, APTUC is, you can see, find out that APTUC is the count of apartments under construction, which might not have been obvious without the definitions. If we go back to data world, those definitions will also be scrolled down here when you're looking at the data dictionary. So that's two ways of getting at the, def uh, the definitions. Finally, when you want to actually work with the data, you'll want to go for the physical tables themselves. Most of them are under these project files. So you'll see the AHS area, you'll see Alberta nonprofit organization. AHS is a nice example because you have the CSV, is the equivalent of this table here. This is the master data about the AHS polygon. When you see the WGS84, that will be your shape file. Now you'll notice some of these reference tables have very little data in them. So we didn't actually create them physically because the data is repeated inside the organization table. Like you can see the quadrant here links to the quadrant here. So in a case like that, you would just see the organization table and then you'll see the quadrant shape file in data.world. In addition to the core files we have, you'll find additional files in the connected data sets. So if you don't find the files up here, check down here. You'll see your spatial files in this set. You'll see homeless files in this set. 
So that would include the emergency shelter. The emergency shelter is one of the best files in here. So do check that guy out. And the community census files are here. And Paul has added a bonus of some Kijiji scrapings. So you can see apartment rentals in two different periods of time. That's very advanced, but if you get through everything else, you can take a look at that. And I believe that's everything you need to know for the data model right now. If you have questions, post them to Slack and we'll help you out. Great. Thanks, Corrine. So uh, uh, Paul will be next with the demo, but there, um, there is a question that has come in about, um, you know, during the course of the month, um, there are a lot of resources there. There's the videos, there'll be this uh, recording of the presentation, uh, there's the information sheet and so on. But, you know, if you do have specific uh, questions or need clarifications or um, that sort of thing, um, and Colleen just mentioned it, it's best to use the Slack channel. So that micro datathon uh, Slack channel in the Alberta, uh, the Data for Good Alberta, uh, will be the best thing to use. Uh, we'll be responding to those on a continuous basis, uh, but also other people may have the same question, right? So uh, we don't want to get into kind of email traffic uh, between one or two people. It's best to share questions, share ideas, um, you know, share your results as you're going. Um, and uh, that's why that Slack channel is there, as well as the, uh, uh, the next cloud to actually share your results, share some of your files, uh, and that sort of thing as well. So, uh, Paula, take it away on the uh, demo. Yes, now I just had to figure out where the mic is. Okay. <laughs> so, um, I'm going to start with uh, something. So, so, the desktop, Power BI desktop, is a designing tool. And uh, I have designed this. Not, it's not perfect. It's not beautiful. It's, uh, it's got some flaws in it, but that's okay. It's, uh, I'm going to start here because I don't know if everybody knows even um, to play around and, and what things or features there are in Power BI. Um, it also is an intro to just building your own, which we will do. We'll do two of those for sure. Um, I am in the desktop now. And uh, the reason why I'm actually in an older version and the reason is because uh, when I collapse this, you see this little minimize, um, I get more uh, screen real estate. There's actually a newer version and um, I'll show you how you can turn it on but I actually reverted to the old one. Um, all these panes exist. Uh, say if I'm, um, when I click on a visual, it's active in the designer. And I could uh, use this filter pane and say, oh wait, we don't wanna do that. Um, a Google keyword. I'm trying to think of a good one. This is, oh, I didn't practice this one. Can you guys tell? <laughs> uh, I can just click on Northwest and filter this way. So uh, just to know that you don't have to have a filter active in your canvas. You can get people to interact that way. Um, that's probably newer in the last uh, year, year and a half. Here is the visualization pane. So as I click here, it tells me it's highlighted this, this map. I happen to have, um, this pie chart here, and uh, I am, if I undo the fields pane, you'll see what's in here, and uh, the check marks tell you what's active in there, if you wanna find it on this side from our whole field search. And basically, the uh, legend is finding places, which has to be something that's calculated. Um, this is reference for you, because I won't go over that in our demo but you can download it and see what that guy looks like. Um, yeah, how do we get out of there? That'd be nice. And um, I basically want to know, uh, it, organizations um, from the way I looked for them could have come from Google Place, but the same organization could have came from the Calgary Foundation. So I kind of wanted to see, oh, did this thing come from both? And um, so that if logic is used to figure out, oh, which ones came from both. Um, as I filter here, it filters the map and it filters this, this word count. This word count is something I got from here because uh, you can actually import 
um, extra visuals that aren't on by default. And um, if I go look, whoops, let me go back to there, sorry. And you can design what you see in the map view to come up to, to uh, tell you more information if you just pause on stuff. If I click on the same spot, it undoes. Just to show that, um, you know, we have the org ID, obviously, because that's what this whole big organization um, table is. I was able to collapse things uh, just to make it easier to look at. Um, that's new in the data model part. I won't go to the data model right away, but if I hover over here, you can see that all those definitions that uh, Corrine had and I had made, um, but she nicely uh, put it in the model. I, uh, in this case, put them here too, because uh, for a starter, it might be good for you guys to, um, it's, it's handy. And uh, I was trying to reconcile everything, making sure we're doing all the right things, <laughs> same things. Uh, this is that data model, uh, basically functioning in Power BI right now. Um, this guy isn't hooked up, but that's okay because I can just drag org ID to this org ID and that will create itself for it. And it's saying that uh, it thinks that there's a one to many relationship. The star is a many. So uh, for some reason it's, it's mentioned many times here you know, something to check at. Um, if you want to actually see how things uh, look, the highlight helps, right? But then you can also see the, check the cardinality and um, the, the filtering direction. I'll talk a bit about that um, in this demo. So um, if you're interested in how I filled this out, I basically, Uh, yeah, I'm lying there. So actually it has a nice metadata thing. You just have to take the time to do it. Um, so I, I thought it would be useful to, for you guys for to get a head start on all this data. Uh, these locations are have points of lat long. If I click on here, I'm using the lat long in this file. Um, but because we have these key hooks to all these other shapes, we can put community here and interact with it. Okay, bad interaction with a pie chart, right? Not really the best. Like what's, you know, a fractionized uh, pie at different levels? Not very good. What can I do here? I can actually go to um, format and edit interactions. Oh, I think I had it on actually. I just turned it off. Edit interactions and I could say, okay, fully filter. When I click on this guy who is active, change it to a fully fl filter instead of a highlight. A filter for a pie chart makes more sense. So now I'm, I'm good there. And that was under format, edit interactions. When I undo it, you see it goes away. Um, when it goes away, you have this filter it reminds you what's set as a filter and affecting the current visual. If you want to see something at larger scale, you can click that uh, view. If you want to change the sort order, because by default it's going by descending order, because typically uh, by convenience people are looking at the most um, mentioned item, um, you can sort by uh, the community name, for example. Oh, did I actually choose the same thing? Crazy, community name. <laughs> there, you can sort by community name when you select community name. And of course you can say ascending. So that's all up to you. Um, you can also export this data or show the data behind it. So there's all sorts of functionality just built into um, Power BI. And that affected my visual because I went over there. So um, let's just go and build one, I think. I'm going to skip over the, right, I have to get to the right place. 
And, and the one that you download, I have this uh, make your own visualization practice and you can see I've been practicing, but we're going to go over this. <laughs> so the first thing you want to do um, is you have all these files. I think um, it's a it's a data model that we're trying to get all the data to effectively and efficiently. You don't see the little yellow um, tables up here because they come in a different way. Those are the ones that are shapes. I'm going to show you how to do that. Um, if you're really, uh, you know, we're, we're still exploring the data. If you're really getting closer and closer to answering that question and providing insight, I would suggest that you have a simpler model. Okay, you're going to distill it down to what you need. Um, so having said that, uh, basically I am going to start with a map and I'm going to tell it's a map because I know where the lat long is. So I click on this one here, which is the Bing default one. Uh, the whole world, it's using that WGS84 information. We have lat long. The lat long is going to be way more accurate than um, using postal code or city or anything at this point. And here we are in Calgary, right there. What do I want to do? Oh, maybe I want to count the number of organizations. We would expect one. Right now, we don't have anything that tells us anything different um, until we put the size. And it's a, an organization ID. Doesn't make sense to sum it. We actually want to count it. It could be the organization name. I picked this. Um, and you can see that we have some repetition here. Um, one thing I wanted to do was also just focus on the Calgary Foundation. So we have a whole bunch of flags here and there's something called Calgary Foundation. It looks like if I just drag it to the canvas, Power BI will take the best guess at the visual. Tableau does the same thing. It decided to use a table. You can see the table is highlighted. And now I can just click on, well, all these ones uh, weren't found by using the Calgary Foundation directory um, under the, the two headings, uh, living standards and wellness that I scraped. And uh, these were. Great, so I know that. I mean, that's, that's kind of helpful, um, but I don't know the proportion of that. So maybe, maybe you know, everybody loves the pie chart. <laughs> uh, rather than create a new one though, let me just remove that. I'm going to click on here, highlight it, and then just click on the pie chart. And it should just change it automatically. What I'm missing is uh, the actual values in here. So again, I'll org ID, organization, doesn't matter. They're going to have to be the count. Could you put another column on there with just a whole bunch of ones to make count easier? Yes, you could. It's not in our current data model. Um, so there we get a little bit of proportion, right? That's nice. If I, in any case, for any of these visuals, um, that paint roller controls what you can do with that visual. So I am actually going to change the data labels and maybe I just want the, uh, not everything, um, category percent of total. Yes, no. So it's labeled a bit. You can finesse those things a bit more. Uh, what I should be doing all the time is fixing the title, and um, it, it gives a good, <laughs> it gives a good computery fixing the title there, because that's the kind of headspace I'm in right now. <laughs> um, but that again, you'd find it on that paint roller, and that's consistent to all of it. Um, but I also can figure out spatially, like I can do the filter like we did before. Um, but I can also actually use it as a legend here. So I find that uh, Calgary Foundation, yes, no, and I'm going to drag that to the legend. And then I get something kind of, well, okay, let's, let's undo it. By the way, I can hit this undo and that'll work. Um, and this map, paint roller again, I can have a whole bunch of map controls and I'm going to take the zoom button and put on just to be easier to, to get to where I want to go. Because um, I know there's an issue here and I'm kind of looking for it. So this guy's big, there's two, it's near the airport. Hmm. I need a little bit more information. So I'll drag that organization on, that's going to help me. I'll get a list. 
and you know, list isn't fancy, but it's going to give me information. I'm exploring stuff. And there you go. Let's click on it. And there you go. There's the shock, trauma, air rescue, and stars. <laughs> yep. Or yeah, I think they're the same thing. And I found them in two different places. Or did I? I'm thinking I did. And to do that, I'll just take that Calgary Foundation flag and make it a legend. And let's see, bump in there again. And you'll see it's split in two. So not a pretty picture. Um, oh wait, to even help me even more is use that organization and put it in the tool tip. It's a character um, and every single a point could actually have more than one valid answer. So it's gonna take the first one. So that's why you see this, um, this process uh, procedure come in front of it. It's gonna take the first one. So hey see. Paula. Yeah? Going to give you the uh, 10 minute warning. Okay. okay. So some of these may be valid, and this is part of what I'd like you guys to do. So that was pretty simple. I am just going to go to the other one where we're doing the Calgary case count. So if I click on this, I'm going to click on it here so you can actually see what the data looks like. I can use this and hopefully we get it. Uh, Calgary cases look like this. So I went to that. Uh, website uh, COVID-19, which actually could show you now, but I won't. And um, uh, Alberta, the Alberta government has it. And if you click on their map, you get the locale. And I've been sort of hand entering it because I was curious and it's a small data set and it should be a good example of how you can um, start with learning how to use this. So we're going to make a map at it. Um, I am going to make a spatial map. This is the default filled map. You have to turn options on to get this one. If you go to file and if you go to options and settings, I'm going to show you this because it's important. <laughs> um, see if you don't do this on your desktop, you, you won't be able to see it. And there are preview features here and you want that shape visual um, and the learn mores are great. Uh, and uh, by the way, I, I turned off the updated ribbon, but this is where I would control all that stuff. So I'm going to use that shape file that's in preview. It has been in preview for a long time. I actually like it quite a bit. And um, AHS local is that key or that name. US is going to show up there. Yeah, that's a problem, but we're not going to worry about that yet. And I'm going to pick a date, um, April 19th for color saturation. Still a problem because we're not in the US. So in the paint roller, what you need to do is go to the shape and you're going to add a map because um, these are special polygons. They're just not the plain old Canada that uh, with the provincial boundaries, which you could, um, if you, I can show you where that is, but it's the AHS area polygons that we provided you with. And there you go, we get the data. And there was one date where I have an all and that's an all. So if I want to change that guy, I can actually, let's go to the 20th. Sure, why not? Okay, now the problem with this one is, is this is something that I told you actually not to do, <laughs> is just a count. All it is is doing the sum, and, and there's only a one value per polygon, so the sum is really the same um, as the actual value provided. Um, so, Let's, you know, you're not really supposed to do that. So what I have done is I have these calculations and um, basically it's easier just to type one in, but I use the divide uh, variable. So just in case you had a null in the denominator, divide protects you from that sort of problem. And um, you take the sum of all the AHS case counts and that's the data I'm grabbing from for that one column. And you take the sum from all the population of 2016. So we're going to see um, how many people in that from that polygon with the po knowing the population and for how many 1,000 people do people have cases. So that's what the calculation is. I'll go back here. And I want you guys to kind of look here when I change it. 
so cases per 1,000. So this, this got lessened, right? And that's because it's now blending in closer. It's probably uh, better when it was, um, so if I undo, it's sort of highlighted, but it's such a small area, fewer people, a better risk presentation is to actually have that uh, ratio. So there's uh, 0.65, people for every 1,000 people that have um, a COVID case, and this is that cumulative count, you know, um, this guy still stands out. Can we still get some information about communities? Sure we can. So if I go to Calgary Community on our main set, um, I, can, I can drag it here. Um, we can actually uh, click here to see, well, what communities are in there? Same with over here. So uh, Bonas, Montgomery, and Parkdale. Um, how many more times now, or should I? I could, I also have a community one. Uh, you would just go through the same process. So the key again is to get this shape file, go here, open shape, and actually uh, get the right one that fits for here. Can you change projection in here? Yes, and that's that orthographic. Is it going to make much of a difference when we zoomed into Calgary? No, no, it's not. So I would uh, take keep the default Mercator. Um, can you change the colors? Sure, you can. So I know. Um, oops, that's under data colors. And you know, I think the Alberta government kind of goes like this, and the maximum is something like that, right? Red to dark red. So. Um, yeah, I'm thinking I can either stop here or I can keep them talking. And so I don't, <laughs> I can stop. Videos are out there and uh, Slack channels there. Right. Yeah, I think it's, I think that's, <laughs> that's great. That's great, Paul. I mean, okay, there, there, is, there, is, there is so much. I'm sure we could be, we could go all night with yeah. the, <laughs> uh, the various options. But yeah, there, there are lots of resources. So uh, check out the videos. Um, the uh, Paul is giving you some links, you know, to some fundamental background around uh, geospatial. And then um, the best place to ask your questions uh, and get, get clarifications is in the Slack channel. So we can have those shared among um, um, among everybody. So it should be a lot of fun. And, and please share your, you know, share your results as well as, as Hannah outlined, right? Uh, your, fill out the insights tab in data.world uh, with what you've done and why you've done it. and if you have code or you have uh, uh, various uh, visualizations to share, um, share those on the uh, on the next cloud as well. So, Corinne, you're going to kind of wrap things up a little bit here with, uh, okay, we've learned a lot about geospatial and some of the tools and what we can do. Uh, well, yeah, but so here are some challenges, um, challenges that you guys can start to work on. Um, that will help you understand the data, help you understand some of the problems and issues uh, uh, related to those, and um, will help all of us to get ready for that, uh, that big datathon um, in the fall. So there you go. Uh, Corinne, take it away. Okay. So, sorry, I think I just stepped on a cat. Um, so, here we have three different levels of challenge. So people who haven't worked with Power BI before will definitely want to start with the simple. And even people who are familiar with Power BI, I'd recommend starting with the simple just to get the basics of the data set under your belt before you go on with the intermediate and the advanced. So we start by saying that you should just get connected with data.world and either um, tie Power BI into data.world, or you can just download the files onto your computer. So first step is the easiest. Next step is to take a look at uh, the organization.csv. So that was that bright green table at the center of our data model. And look at how this uh, file, how this table relates to everything else. And remember to look at the data model because the diagram the high level and then the detailed really help put that together. 
then start to make some simple queries like how many organizations are shared um, have keywords in Google Place so you can look at the organization Google Place keyword to find that answer then you can plot how many organizations belong to each sub key issue or I guess we could say address each sub key issue based on data with the Calgary Foundation organization. Now we'll have a little more fun by making chloro choropleths and we're going to pull in the Calgary community census data and they have census data on community population also counts of community dwellings like apartments, condos, single family houses, and you could plot apartment vacancy rate. So you can get a quick idea of what are the desirable places to live in Calgary, according to renters at least. Then um, add some filtering kind of ability. So if you look at the Calgary census data, you'll see they have, they break down population by age ranges. So you could put, make a filter with all those age ranges and then you can click ages on and off to see where the youngest people are living in Calgary or the oldest. And you can check by gender as well, by male, female and other. So um, looking at the Calgary Community Census, we'll, you'll see there's a lot of things about housing in there. There's a lot of things about population. These could both be really helpful for the fall and any other data work you ever do about Calgary. Finally, you could plot all the organizations on a map of Calgary um, within an area of your choice, like within a community. And this is all just to get your feet wet with Power BI. Nothing too earth shattering in the simple. Now the intermediate, we step things up. And we'd like to start by seeing who would like to integrate emergency shelter stay data with our organization data. Now the catch is, is we haven't worked on this yet. So this is something we will be working on unless one of you beat us to it. So if somebody is interested, they could work at linking our organization's org ID. This is the center of our universe. And then the emergency shelter stay data has an org name. And if you make a cross reference between the two, then you could start um, looking at the number of shelter stays in various neighborhoods at various times of the year. So if you do this, please save any notes about what you did and send us your results, the notes and the outcome, because we'd be thrilled to take advantage of your knowledge. Also, if you find an organization in the emergency shelter stay that doesn't exist in our org organization table, then see if you can find it in the real world and then we can add it to our organization table. So this is your chance to help um, extend our data set. Now the next assignment is, I hope a fun one. The city of Calgary has published their census results and it's in a big PDF, like 150 pages. I pulled out page 37, which shows the average number of residents per dwelling by stru select structure type. So you can see for wards one to 14, um, you can see the apartment, condo, um, sorry, the lists are down here, converted structure, communal housing, duplex, et cetera. And you can see the average number of residents in each of these. And then they give a ward average of 1.87 but they just like averaged these numbers. So to get a little familiar with making calculations in Power BI, I'd like you to find the data that um, tells you how many people live in apartments or um, how many apartments, sorry, there are in Ward 1 and how many duplexes in Ward 1 and then weight these numbers. So it's rather than just take 1.64, you'd be taking a weighted apartment by how many apartments, how many duplexes, how many single family houses, and then see really what the weighted ward average is and what the weighted apartment average is citywide. So I think that would be a more interesting um, result. And uh, 
a good challenge for you guys to pull that together. And likewise, there's a vacancy rate on page 39 that gives vacancy rate by structure type, but the catch is, is there's no vacancy rate in the data. So you'll have to find the, um, you will have to find the calculation or decide what the calculation is. You can validate it by seeing if your result matches the results that they give, and then see if you can reproduce the table on page 39, and then produce an equivalent table where the totals are weighted averages. So again, doing a weighted average. And finally, on both of these, plot these on a map. Now advanced, we really open things up. So first of all, go ahead and find other open data sources that you think would be relevant and interesting. For example, you can look at census tract data. We'll be covering the federal census tract in a future meeting, I hope, but there's nothing to stop you from looking now or looking for other data that's organized by census tracts or city wards or city communities and then pulling that data in and mapping it and showing it off to the rest of the data for good community. Uh, like we say here, you get a bonus, a pat on the back in any case, if the data you find has potential relevance to homeless issues or helping to um, solve homeless issues. The next uh, thing you could do is, uh, if you're interested, is take a closer look at our organization list and see if you can find any problems with it. Kick the tires, because we just pulled this together a few weeks ago, so we haven't gone through in detail. Like uh, Paula shows you, we know STARS is in there twice, so that's an example of some data we'd like to clean up. But maybe there's something else in there, and if you want to find it and let us know about it, we'd appreciate it. Remember, if you have any recommendations, let us know why, or let us know your sources, and make sure you tell us about it. The third uh, activity you can do, which is again data quality related, is to improve links between the CRA donee and the AB nonprofit with their organization. Because all these tables, they talk about organizations, but they often have slightly different names. So it's not always obvious if it's the same organization you're talking about. And it may take um, some Googling, looking at uh, whatever information you can find to see if you can resolve the question. If you feel you found an answer, do tell us why. Again, cite sources if you have them and get the results to us. A fourth assignment is to see if you can come up with the start of a good keyword list to help us during our homeless datathon this fall. So we mentioned that we got keywords from Google Place. We have issues and sub issues from Calgary Foundation. And here's the list of the Calgary Foundation issues and sub issues that Paula used as a starting point. And here's a list of some of those keywords or search terms that she used in Google Places. Now, is there a way that we can start to merge these two lists into one list that then can reference what Calgary Foundation calls it and what Google Place calls it? That would help when we're reporting across data in different places if we can find that Rosetta Stone of keywords that ties everything together. And in listening to Paula tonight, I've come up with possibly a sixth challenge or fifth challenge. And this would really stretch your ability to um, work with geospatial data. And that would be to play with her Kichiji Calgary long-term housing scrapes. Because these housing scrapes have not been vetted yet by Paula to make them user friendly. So they've got addresses and postal codes, but I don't believe they have lat longs in them. So you would be able to use QGIS, for example, to put a lat long and then be able to plot 
the locations on a map and start to do calculations about average rent and diversity in rent. And perhaps a count of apartments available compared to the city of Calgary census of apartments in that neighborhood. So that the Kijiji Calgary long term housing scrapes, I think, would be interesting for people that want to try and reproduce the kind of work that uh, Paula did with the organizations. And I think that pretty much sums up all your challenges. If you'd like to do other challenges, don't feel constrained by this list. Um, the sky's the limit. Absolutely. Thanks. Thanks, for, Corinne, for uh, reviewing those. And yeah, for sure. I mean, these uh, at whatever level you're you're at, uh, these these challenges are starting points to really get you thinking and to get going. And then, but you know, be creative, be innovative, um, share as much uh, of that uh, uh, results with us, and uh, I think that will be great. And so, you know, the over the course of the next month, um, um, the opportunity to work on these and to uh, communicate and, and share the results, um, ask questions. Um, at our next uh, uh, fourth Thursday, which would be May 28th, um, we will then be introducing and launching the uh, uh, micro datathon number two. So it will be a, a another set of, of uh, data and another set of challenges and, and a good opportunity to use your skills and practice and and, co and collaborate and, and share it among ourselves. So um, I think it's best if we uh, kind of wrap things up here. Um, you may have specific questions or other questions uh, uh, that you wanted to ask. Uh, I would encourage you to put those into the Slack channel and then we can start that discussion and other people may be thinking of the same, uh, the same type of uh, question um, as well. So at this point, I, uh, I'd really like to thank um, um, Paula and Corinne and, and Henna for all the, uh, the preparation and, and work going into it. Uh, the other members of the Data for Good core team, a lot of uh, support uh, roles as well. Um, this is a new idea. This is something new for us. So uh, uh, testing it out, uh, let us know what works, you know, what hasn't worked. Um, uh, be gentle, be kind. Uh, we're all volunteers, and uh, we're just trying to help our uh, help our data community, and ultimately um, help those nonprofit uh, social organizations that are that are doing amazing things in our in our community. So, thanks a lot. Uh, we'll sign off now, and uh, we'll see you online over the course of the next month. Uh, take care. Uh, stay home and stay safe.